The person who writes down the thing has tremendous power. Why are hyperlinks blue? Because I like blue. <laughs> you are kind of a meme lord. You're your best when you're a little bit of a rage. And it's actually funny because if you could take Nietzsche from, you know, 120 years ago and put him on Twitter, he'd be like the best tweeter of all time. He'd have at least a million followers. Yeah, yes, exactly. <laughs> there are certain like just atomic units of media that just seem to recur over and over in history. Tell me about that. Within a year or two, there is going to be a generative AI tool where you feed it an essay and it will give you the short film. Five years from now, you know, we'll, we'll be sitting here and it'll be like, oh my God, this has all changed. You heard it here first. <laughs> There's a sentence that you shared in an interview that I thought was fascinating, that you're talking about your, it's time to build peace. And you said that you wrote it in a rage. <laughs> you wrote it in a rage. Tell me about that. So, so the big one of that, I was literally rage. It was the, it was the specific, specific event happened. Um, and it was the, it was the onset of COVID. And at the time it was the, the, you know, if you remember the banner headlines about PPE and it was like masks, right. And it was, it was basically masks. And then in, it, the prediction was all the hospitals were going to get swamped. And there was that period actually where the hospitals in New York like got swamped. And so, and then there was just this like massive shortage of PPE. And so like, literally there were people in the white house, like trying to figure out how to like source surgical masks. So, like, oh, there was like this competition. Then the state started competing. It was this like crazy thing. Um, and then, um, and then at, at one point they ran out of surgical gowns in hospitals, um, in New York. And so the, the city government of New York, de Blasio, uh, put on a call, could people please donate their rain ponchos <laughs> for the use in hospitals and surgical gowns. <laughs> and, you know, it's like front page Wall Street Journal, right? Yeah. Story. And I read this and I was just like, all right, this is it. We've hit the like event horizon of stupidity. Yeah. This is ridiculous. Yeah. Right. And of course, you know, this is a long running topic in like American culture, right? Which is like, are you, um you know, does America build things? Um, and we, we could have a long conversation about that, but clearly if we've reached the point where we're, you know, looking for, clearly we've lost something in terms of the national productive spirit. Um, and so all of my bottled up energy came, was it Hemingway, Heming, was it Hemingway said writing, writing is the process of opening a vein and letting the blood s s spread out of the page. So what happened? Where and, were and you? This was my, my version of that. Where were you? What time was, of day? What I was happened? at home. I was at home. You're yeah, at home? It was, at home. It, was, it was the beginning of the lockdowns. I get the sense that you're a real night owl. Yes. So we're, was it nighttime and what happened? You just go to the computer and it's like, Phew. well, that was what, so that was at the beginning of COVID. So I was, and I actually didn't even have a home office at that point because we were working, I would always be in the office, you know, during, during the day. Um, and so I was sitting in our breakfast room at, at work at, at home and I had this, you know, the breakfast chair that I was sitting in and it was like not a dynamic. And so, but it was when, when this whole Zoom thing started. And so I'm yeah. sitting there for like 12 hours a day on Zoom calls and I like had shooting pain all the way down the right side. <laughs> Oof. Body, yeah, I stopped working out, and and, and so I you know, I, and I felt terrible by everything that's happening, and I was, you know, I felt terrible about what's happening in the world, and then I felt terrible because sure. companies were going to go through all this, all this chaos, um, and so it was kind of during that whole process, yeah. But then, yeah, for me, for me, if it's yeah, the writing, it'd be it'd be late at night. So what happened? So you sit down to write that. How long does that take? And then I get the sense that that piece wasn't really edited. I get the sense that like you write it and then you ship it really shortly thereafter yes well, hopefully if you, when you say it wasn't edited hopefully is, is that a compliment or is <laughs> no that's just from research. normally when a professional say, says that they would you'd be like oh well you have <laughs> do you have an editor something that you said like a decade ago is that you don't really like to edit your writing and then i just vaguely remember you saying that you wrote it and then you published it right after you did it pretty fast so so i thought uh, let's see what you think i think the key to, at least for me the key to successful writing for a lot of people like what a lot of people do when they try to write is they end up writing in a very different voice than how they talk. Um, and it ends up being, you know, sort of stilted and, uh, and unnatural. And, 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 and for, at least for the interesting people I know, the best form of their writing is when they're writing in the exact same way that they talk. It's exactly like having you know, a conversation with them. So I figure like, if I can just get what I would say, like over lots out onto the page, like that, that, that's as good as it's going to be for me. Um, and so it, it, yeah, it's kind of, it's kind of that now, you know, I'm working in the essay format, not the book format. So it's an easier, it's an easier challenge. Well, you're your best when you're a little bit of a rage. I think, I think, I, I believe that's the case. Yes. Like, I feel that. <laughs> I, I feel that. Yes. A little bit of energy. Yes, exactly. Yes. No, a lot of energy. A lot of energy. Yes, exactly. Does that well, happen a lot? So this is the other thing just in terms of my writing. Like, I don't, and you know, someday I would like to, some, someday I would like to be much more professional about this, but like, I, I don't, you know, I've read all these, you know, interviews and seen your stuff and so forth. And it's everybody, all the professional writers have these systems for tracking all they've got the, like I read that, was it Umberto Echo book at one point about how to write a thesis and he's got the card catalog system. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Some people use like Evernote. I don't have any of that. Right. And so it's just like, I'm reading all day. I'm talking to people all day. Basically stuff is, is showing up in my head. It hits a, a point of critical mass. Um, and it basically it's a two part process. One is an out, I just like try to basically put, put out an outline as fast as I can. Um, say disgorge an outline <laughs> as fast as I can. So I just try to get the structure down. Um, and then I just do basically a narrative pass. 
Wait, that's surprising. Yeah. You do an outline for your writing. The reason that it's surprising is most people I know who get really passionate about an idea, they just get to it. They need to get the whole thing out. Yeah. That's an anomaly what you do there. So I'm trying to go even faster. So that first phase, I'm trying to go even faster. I'm trying to get all the points out. And I don't want to slow down the process of getting all the points out by trying to turn them all into prose. Uh-huh. So it's, so it's not like a detailed outline like a novelist would have or something like that, but it's like a, it's like basically bullet points. I, I sort of think in terms of bullet points. And so it's basically just if, like if, I, can, if I can list the 15 or 20 key points, it, then I can just get them all out. And, and, and like I said, at this point, for me to be doing this at this point, I've been thinking about the topic long enough where I have a bunch of stuff that I know that I want to say. And so I try to put it all down and then I just, and then I try to have that be in some sort of sensible order. And then did and you then, start with it's time to build or was that an emergent property as a catchphrase no that was i mean that was sort of the, the i mean that was the i mean it, it was literally you stood up at the table you're like it's, time to, it's time to build well it's got for what i you know it's got to be something very simple straightforward punchy right it's got to be something you know i uh, like you know i i'm look i'm trained part of this is i'm trained in marketing and like you know the whole art of marketing is like you have to punch through like you know the, the world is awash with media of, of every kind and so for for any anybody doing anything that they want to get so it's got to be like punchy and aggressive and then for build i just i wanted to broaden out you know, especially because so much of what I've done historically is software. We have to recapture the spirit of industry that we used to have um, and that we sort of drained out of our system. So tell me about this reading all day, talking all day. Where do you fit that in? Because I was looking at your calendar, at least the one that you published most recently. Yeah, like 30 minutes for reading. Now you do have these free time sections that I want to hear about. But you said reading, talking to people. How do you actually build that into your life? Yeah. So I would say a couple of things. So one is, um, I, I have a very, I have a very kind of, there's a very kind of fortunate twist, um, in my career in, in the following sense for this, which is the people I get to talk to all day, just in my day job tend to be very interesting people. Um, and, and specifically the, the founders, right. Uh, a lot is, is a lot of it. So the, the, the tech founders who kind of get all the way through kind of the whole process to like get in the room with us, like they, they, their companies may or may not succeed, but they tend to be the leading people in the world on the topics that they're, they're, that, that, that they're talking about. And then we try to get into the very deep, you know, kind of conversations with them. And, and, they're, and they're in a mode of trying to explain themselves as best they can because they're, you know, trying to raise money. And, and they want us to understand what they're doing because they want a partner that actually understands what they're doing. And so they, they, they tend to basically just, they, they just tell us everything. It's actually a fairly amazing thing. Like we don't even sign NDAs. They just like come in and tell us everything. Right. Um, and so, um, and then I've got, you know, the ones that I meet with personally, and then I've got all the ones my partners meet with that they tell me about. And then we've got all the notes from all the ones that, you know, I'm not able to be in like an hour with somebody who's a specialist in topic X, you're just going to learn a lot. That's, that's not obvious. Um, so that's part of it. And then the reading side, I'm just basically every day. I've always been like this. I just, I'm reading basically every spare minute that I have on your phone, iPad. Well, sort of everything. And so actually, interestingly, um, the AirPods are probably the single biggest technological leap in my life since I was probably a little kid that like actually really mattered um, because they're the unlock for me for audiobooks um, and 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 podcasts and interviews and all these things. And so I'm doing audio content probably two to three hours a day. And it's, you know, getting up in the morning, going to bed at night, all the drive time, like all that that stuff. And so if if nothing else is going on, I'm always listening, listening to something. What's your podcast to audiobook ratio? So it goes back and forth. If I'm going down the rabbit hole on something that I'm that I'm kind of hoovering up podcasts and YouTube interviews, and and then oh, the other thing is it's actually a, a really wonderful time for this now because the tech text to speech stuff is getting really good. Um, and so you know more and more on like the Substack app has really good text text to speech. Now, and I use this thing called Natural Reader that's it's really good. Um, and and in fact, Apple's actually producing audiobooks with with AI voices, um, which sounds spectacular. It's like it's really starting to work. Um, and so if I'm down the rabbit hole, I'm going as deep as I can and, and, and doing that. Um, if not, I'm tr- I generally am trying to get, no, no offense to a prominent podcaster, I, I try to get back to audiobooks as much as possible. And the reason is just because audiobooks are my opportunity to really learn a new area that I probably don't know anything about. Um, and so if I, if, I can, if I can scrape aside 10 or 20 hours of audio time for you know, a period of history or something like that, I can really go deep on it. Do you have a sense for the kinds of books that you like doing on audiobooks versus when you're actually reading them, or are you fairly indifferent to the trade-offs there? So for nonfiction, I I, I am trying to actually get back to reading more nonfiction, um, and I've actually like over the summer got my whole like new, the whole you know Kindle set up and like worked worked on all this, um, and I might be downloading the occasional book from Libgen. Um, probably shouldn't shouldn't admit to that. Uh, of course, only books that I've also purchased uh, <laughs> uh, in in in, in, uh, in hardback, which is actually generally true. But in practice, most nonfiction books, m- mostly that's audio. But then look, the, the other part of it is just, you know, most of my time is spent reading, you know, it's, it's reading online material of one kind or another. 
Um, I, I, I generally try to, my, my general method is to try to barbell my information intake. So it's either stuff that is super current uh, or it's stuff that's timeless. Um, and so what I'm trying to do is not read, uh, basically not try, I'm trying to not read anything that's from yesterday through to like 10 years ago. I'm trying to like screen all that stuff out. And so I'm trying to be super current and the form of being super current is talking to people who are currently experts or it's, or it's specifically Twitter, right? It's sort of the, you know, sort of the fire, the, the fire hose on Twitter. Um, and then for timeless, it's, it, you know, at that point, that's almost all books, but I, I kind of go back and forth between these modes. Right. So yeah, I'm either listening to like a, a book on usually history or biography or something like that, or some new demand that I'm trying to learn, or I'm like up to the minute, here's what's happening in AI today. How did you come up with this idea of group chats? Like you are the group chat king. Oh. And I think that the way that you're using group chats is very interesting. You know, look, it's become very fashionable, you know, these days for people to be like, oh, you know, online communication is terrible compared to real world and all this. And it's just, it's just people are low, the whole thing. And I actually think like, eh, there's some truth to that, but I actually think the, uh, the opposite of that is also very yeah. true, which I think you probably have this experience that the people you're on uh, a chat app with or in a group chat with, like you probably essentially talk to every day. Every day. Right. And so you have this like constant ambient, you know, basically communication. So I've got, you know, friends that I, you know, I've got, I don't know, some set of friends across all these things. The one-to-one communication is limited for obvious reasons. And then, you know, I, I would like to live in a world in which every discussion could happen fully in public. Um, and, you know, I, and actually, I, you know, I went through my own transformation on this along with a lot so of people. So Quran would have something to say about the effectiveness of that. Right. I mean, he's, yeah, no, his, his book on that is exactly relevant. When I started being active on Twitter, which was, I don't know, whatever, 2013 or 2012, you know, not that early, but 2012, 2013, like, you know, my assumption was still, you know, my incredibly naive assumption was, well, you can just talk about everything that you're thinking about on Twitter. Turns out that's not true, no. <laughs> um, which, you know, I learned the hard way, you know, sort of yep. several times. Yep. Um, and so, you know, we live in a, we live in a time, you, know, you mentioned team, teamers work. So this idea of preference falsification, you know, basically as this, as this is a private, private truths, truths, public lies, public lies. And it's just like, we live in an era for better or for worse. We live in an era in which I think the level of public lying is like, a, you know, it, it's like, it's gotta be near an all time high. Well, to get back to this group chat idea, I think that this would be, you know, if insofar as there's public lies, but insofar as, hey, you can actually get interesting things out of group speech and get a certain kind of truth, how would you think about curating a group chat so that you maximize the truth? Because there is something that happens. Like there is a beautiful scale between like four and eight people who have high trust. And then once you hit like 10 people, all of a sudden you get stage fright and all of a sudden you lose some of that public now it begins like a it begins to be a performance or something like that and i wonder how how would you think about group chats to get the best information the best people together yeah well so i think that's part of it and then i i maybe put an orthogonal thing on it also which is um there there is this well known sort of concept of group polarization so you you put a group a bunch of studies in this you you put a group together and and they're sort of predisposed in a certain direction and then you let them talk amongst themselves for some period of time they all end up much more extreme on whatever that is um, and so, you know, there's a st stereotypical example would be like, you know, people who like enjoy like shooting guns on the weekends, but aren't particularly political about guns. Yeah. A year later, they're going to be like, oh, t t together they will have become like raving second amendment. Yeah, exactly. Right? Or, or, what, or, what, or whatever that issue is. Card carrying NRA members. Uh, exactly. Right. Because, because what, you know, what happens is the group's existing tendencies reinforce each, you know, sort yeah, of, you get the sort of social effect, social proof effect where they kind of all go. And so I, I think part of it also is it, it, it's never just about one group chat it, it, to, to really do, do this well. It, it's actually several or many. You want to have a whole bunch and you want to have a whole bunch of, with, with people with very different perspectives, ideally very different perspectives, very different inclinations. And then if you take the meta view, you kind of, is what you kind of watch them all and they're all kind of going off kind of in their, in their, in their own direction. And then, you know, some of them just got get too extreme or locked in or down a rabbit hole, you know, and then maybe that's the time to create another one and, and kind of reset the dynamic. Uh, and then, and then the other thing back to your point on selecting things is like, as you know, it's like any, it's like a dinner party. Every person matters. It's very easy. You know, like it's very easy to, it's very easy to have a dinner party where nobody's, you know, nobody's really speaking up and is that interesting and it's kind of dull, but it's also very easy to have a dinner party where there's one person who totally destroys the dynamic, right? It just makes it all about themselves. And so there's the, and then you've got the social protocol of like, so if you, so you get the social protocol with eight people and then everybody kind of realize everybody, you know, seven people realize that that one other person shouldn't be there. So then you create the spinoff and then it's like, you need to make sure the other person doesn't find out about the spinoff. Yeah. You know, it's funny if I take like a meta view of. The last 10 years of reading your writing, I find this like this stutteriness between this deep drive that you have to be prolific and be creative that is core and it's back to that rage. Like it just burns within, like I can feel it. But at the same time, this public image that you have and some of the controversy that you've been around and you sort of have gone in these fits and starts. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, yeah, very much. Well, so 
then I specifically just, you know, this is maybe a, a general problem also for a lot of people is, you know, if, if, if I were like a full-time, like public intellectual writer, you know, just representing myself, you know, there are things that I might say or issues I might get involved in that I, I find very exciting and interesting, but <laughs> as the world exists today, like I, you know, I represent a firm, I represent all of my partners, I represent all the companies we work with. And so that, 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 that you've probably seen me in, in, in public kind of going through this, but like in, in practice, there, there's a calibration process. I want to be true to myself and I always want to be honest and I want to be interesting and I want, you know, we have a point of view on things. We want to get that point of view out, but like, I, I can't, I can't be reckless in doing that. I have professional responsibilities that preclude me from being reckless. I would say pick my topics, but also pick my methods of engagement. And, and that's, that's an ongoing process. For example, so the current arrangement that I have with my partners who love me and I respect them enormously uh, for helping me with this, um, you know, I, I'm not like an active tweeter, right? Because it's just, it's just simply too easy to get in trouble on that. Um, but I am allowed, <laughs> permitted <laughs> by them and by myself, right? I can write essays, right? Number one is just like the essay really gives you a chance to like fully articulate yourself, right? Um, and then it's just harder, you know, people can take excerpts out of an essay or out of a podcast, but it's just harder to like take a single, like the way you could take a single tweet and hang somebody out to dry with it. It's like, it's, it's harder to do that out of a, out of a, out of an essay. If, if only because there actually is this, people don't have to imagine the surrounding context that actually see the surrounding context. So at least I think for right now, for me, it's, it's essays and conversations is, is what, what I can practically do. I miss the Straussian days when your Twitter likes were a way of communication. So that was very, yes. <laughs> yes, there's real signal there. And then I would get, yeah, this is the thing. This is the, uh, and then I, I would literally get, the reporters literally would write hit pieces on me about my Twitter likes. And, and again, if I were just like, you know, if I were just like Mark Andreessen, and private citizen, that would be fine. But, you know, rep, rep, representing, you know, whatever 500 companies that we work with, like I can't, I can't do that because. I can't put the CEOs in a position where they have to explain to their employee bases what Mark likes on tweet. Well, it's crazy because you you are kind of a meme lord. Like you also came up with software eating the world. How did that happen? Twenty twelve Wall Street Journal was it something like that? Yeah, that's right. Okay, yeah, right around then. So yeah, so so that one was more what I thought was a statement of the obvious. Uh, my my big worry on that one was it actually wasn't provocative enough because I thought it was just sort of like obviously the way the world was going. But the the thing that made it provocative, I think, at the time. Um, was that was the, that was sort of in the aftermath of the 2008 crash, and you know we we had just started the firm and we're working with all these companies and we're looking around and it's just like mobile's taking off and the cloud is taking off and SaaS is taking off and like all these things are taking off and it's just like you know and e-commerce and broadband and mobile broadband and all these things, social networking and it's just like wow like if if you look at what's actually happening it's just this like explosion of adoption. I mean that's really when the internet kind of went you know kind of really, really went hit the knee of the curve and became became central to everything. And how did that piece actually get written? Like, what was the genesis, the the Big Bang oh, theory of that piece? That one was written out of frustration, maybe as opposed to rage. Ah, okay. Uh, <laughs> I'm sensing a pattern here. Yes, yeah. exactly. So, so again, it was like actually sitting down and writing. It didn't take very long, but it, it was it was years of discussions and thought, you know, and sort of building up the thesis and and, and kind of thinking about it. Um, and then it was just frustration. It was just, and honestly, a lot of it was just the, the frustration of the daily headlines that were just I just thought like just ridiculously overly negative. Um, and, um, you know, people just like did not understand what was happening. And, and, you know, look, I, 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 part of what I try to do with writing is I, I get frustrated when I think people don't understand something, but of course then, you know, it, that actually that, then I, if, if I come to my senses, I'm like, no, it's my fault because I haven't explained it and I should at least try to explain it. Um, and so, um, it's up to people whether they listen, but I'll, I'll at least try. Um, and so, um, yeah, it was to try to basically work out that frustration and at least lay out a thesis for, um, you know, for, for actually for in, in the tech industry for optimism and then outside the tech industry, uh, you know, maybe people might want to actually understand what's happening. What does it say about your approach to distribution that that was a wall street journal op-ed and then 10 years later you write, it's time to build. And that is on an owned and operated property that you have. We'll see if I'm allowed to keep the section in. Um, <laughs> so we, um, you know, we, we just assumed that we would try to place the software eats the world thing. And we talked to, you know, we'd end up being the wall street journal, but we talked to talk to different people about it. And, and I would say by, yeah, so 2020 was, was the, it's time to build. And so we, we actually thought, you know, well, we might as well like see if the journal run it again. And they were like, nope. Um, and then we approached the other like major pubs and they were like, nope. Um, and so it was quite literally turned down. Um, and it was actually a catalyzing moment for me, which is, it was because, you know, I, like everybody else, I had tracked the sort of rising hostility on the part of the kind of mainstream press towards tech you know, kind of between the 2015 to 2020 era. But I still was at that point, like holding on to this idea that they were still like the, you know, the venue for like serious thought discussion. Um, and then they, they, th th that was when they convinced me, <laughs> they convinced me that they weren't. Um, yeah. And then uh, in, in, in retrospect, probably what I should have done is built up a much bigger independent audience much faster, but this worked out.
this isn't news to you, but dude, you invented the tweet store. I know. Exactly. Yes, exactly. Well, and yes, and I played some role before that. And so how did that happen? Yeah. Oh, so the tweet storm. Well, it's, it's okay. So the tweet storm is just that I have too much to say. And you know, this 140 character thing is yeah. just like obviously inadequate. So yeah. Yeah. And Elon hadn't come along yet. So you could do, you could do long form. What were the early days of that like? probably frustration it was just like i have i have more things that i want to say and so i'll just like keep i'll just keep adding on tweets and then of course it was an enormous at the time it was an enormous amount of i would say half serious and half comic half kind of comical you know blowback right which is like you know you're doing it wrong right you're you're abusing the medium no i was like i, I you know i'm not yeah, sure i'll abuse the medium but yes that's what they're there for there are certain like just atomic units of media that just seem to recur over and over in history and it's funny because they go in and out of fashion, right? Uh, and so there, there used to be this thing called the aphorism, right? And and so the, you know these these there were like great writers and philosophers. Like half of what Nietzsche's output was like aphorisms, and all these other Rochefoucauld and all these people would write these aphorisms. And then at some point that became like a self. There was like a self. It was like a you know a poor Richard's almanac kind of thing. And at some point they got corny, and people like stopped using aphorisms. You know, like witty little asides and stuff like that. They just kind of went out of fashion, and then tweets. Right. And Twitter brought back the aphorism, right? Tw Twitter is aphorisms as a service, but it's like th there is, right? There, there is historical continuity there, right? And it's actually funny because if you could take Nietzsche from, you know, 120 years ago and put him on Twitter, he'd be like the best tweeter of all time. He'd have at least a million followers. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> and he'd have a pretty, have a great banner image on his, on his, uh, <laughs> on his page. But you God know, is dead. Yeah. Exactly. He was great at that stuff. Right? Yeah. Um, and then, you know, the other one is the, the essay, right? And I, when I, you know, kind of when I grew up, I never really read essays growing up because, you know, as, by the time I was like reading, it was, you know, basically all the serious, basically all the serious work was happening with like long, you know, long form narrative prose. Um, but, you know, there were prior eras where like essays, you know, if you read like a lot of older, if you read books, by the way, including Nietzsche's books from like a hundred or 200 years ago, like a lot of books in those days, they were just basically compilations of essays, right? To, you know, today they were just basically, you know, you, you'd have like a hundred, a hundred small chapters. It's like a much more of a, of a common format. And then a lot of books were serialized or, you know, things would start out as like newspaper articles and then they get rolled up into being books. And so you, you had this sort of short form narrative prose thing. But then when like books went really big in the 20th century and became like a mass market thing, you know, it became 200 or 300 pages, became the format everybody wrote in. And it's just still the case today. It's like, you know, eight or 10 chapters, 200 or 300 pages. And so, and so essays became this like weird literary academic thing that nobody really paid attention to. And then blog posts. Right. And then all of a sudden the essay is back. Right. Um, and so these, you know, the, these, the, 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 basically they're these, you know, and then my other favorite example is poetry. Right. Like when I was a kid, it's like poetry is like the, I don't know, it's like people did in the old days. And it's like some, you know, I don't know, some literary fancy thing that, you know, normal people don't read. And then of course, hip hop, you, you know, brings literally, you know, poetry. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, and so anyway, yeah. So it turns out these literary forms basically recur over and over again. They, they never die. And then it, it, and then it turns out the the internet is like the you know the 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 sort of meta medium for all of these. The, ultimately, I think that's the big breakthrough, like um, sort of communicate sort of information conveyance kind of breakthrough of the internet. Is the internet is capable of representing every other prior form of literary art or visual art, right, um, or audio or any, any, anything else? And so all of a sudden, right, aphorisms and essays and poetry in the form of you know tweets and blog posts and, and rap lyrics are just like explosively, right. You know, uh, important, um, and you know, primary means of communication. What was the motivation behind your personal blog? It was the same thing. I was like, I, I had a lot to say. Well, actually a lot, a lot of that. Okay. Frustration. A lot of that was, <laughs> okay. Frustration. A lot of that was uh, say, uh, bad startup, bad startup advice. Um, and so there's just, you know, it, it, there's, there's an, well, there's an oversupply of bad advice in the world generally, but specifically there's probably an oversupply of bad startup advice. There's a lot of people giving advice to startups that maybe have not actually been through all the things that they're, that they're talking about. And for better or for worse, I've been through it all and I've made all the mistakes and I've seen it all and I've lived with the consequences of all the decisions that you make at a startup. And so I figured I should just actually start to write some of this stuff down. What'd you learn from having Venkatesh Rao around? Breaking Smart is so good. Breaking Smart. He was our first and only philosopher in residence. Uh, which is actually something I would like to do again. I, I just, we've been too busy, but I would like to do that again. So he's one of these very special people. I've only ever met, I think I'd say I probably only have really ever met three people in my life who I would describe as basically um, perpetually lateral thinkers, L-A-T-E-R-L, lateral, um, uh, in that, and I actually tell you there, it's actually him, it's Balaji Srinivasa, and, and it's Peter Thiel. Um, and what those, and those, they're, they're very different, they're, you know, they're very different views and very different kind of life trajectories. But what, what they all have in common is when they're presented with a situation, 
they never think about it the way everybody else does. Like they just, they don't. And so as a consequence, like I'll spend as much time with the three, you know, the three of those as, as, as I possibly can, because what I find, um, like I'm an okay lateral thinker, but they're, they're much better than I am. And I think it's, 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 it's two things. Um, one is they're just really smart and they know a lot about a lot of things. Um, and so they're, they're able to, to sort of apply a lot, to able to kind of cross different kinds of knowledge together. Um, uh, but the other is they just, they, they, they all have, and it's, it's not even a habit. It's just how they are. They, they do this reflexively. Um, and so if you, if what, what I find is if I spend time with them, I start to also do it reflexively. Cause that's just, I always think like, okay, what, what you know, what, if, if I were a true lateral thinker the way they are, like, how would I think about this? Um, and so, you know, being with them over the years has kind of trained me of like, okay, when somebody says X, like never just take it on face value, always be like, you know, okay, there's another way of looking at this, you know, or if somebody proposes a certain plan of action, right. Or somebody has an assessment of how the world works, like let, let's come at it from multiple angles and try to think about that. Why wouldn't you just hire like 10 insane lateral thinkers? put them on payroll, pay them a hundred grand a year and just have them around. Like that just seems like such low hanging fruit. You have the internet, like, why don't you do this? It might be a good idea. Yeah, I, I, I think the, the practical objections for it would just be like, okay, are they really not, you know, if they're so smart, shouldn't they be in the decision making loop? Right. No, but it's smart along a different vector, right? Yeah. Like Venkatesh Rao isn't going to build billion dollar startups, but he's doing this for you. He's lateral thinking. He's getting you out of your you know, the same sort of cycles of thought. This just seems like the easiest low hanging fruit that I don't understand why people don't do more. It's the group. It may be a good idea. It's the group dynamic thing. It's like, okay, now you've got more people in the room. Fine. Then have three of them. I know, but like, it's just every person in the room changes the dynamic. Sure. Are people going to be embarrassed by what they have to say? Cause these guys, you know, it, you know, so everybody's going to wait to hear what these guys say, even though they're not making the decisions. Yep. And then why are they not in the room? If they're not making the decisions. And then the younger people in the organization are like, wait a minute, they're filling up seats in the room that I should be in. So it's just a, it's a, yeah. I mean, it's a good prompt. It's a good challenge. Um, yeah. I, I, I mean, has anybody, has that ever actually, I mean, we, we, we did, we, it was great for us while we, while we had him, but like, has that ever, has anybody ever done what you're saying? Like, I think Peter Thiel Peter, totally does it. He does that somewhat. Yeah. With certain people, but, but I will tell you, I mean, even that's a good example, like there, there is dissent. It causes problems. It, okay. It's, it, it's not without its, it's not sure. without his broken glass. You yeah. know, and then there, you know, you know, in some cases there'll be jealousy. Like, you know, he has, you know, he's got these other people that have his ear. Sure. I don't know. So it's, it's, there's some balance with running the organization, but it's a good, I'll, I'll think on that. Okay. That's a good prompt. Cool. And then of course the obvious one, you know, that the, the obvious one that everybody's kind of has looming over their head right now is, you know, should, should, uh, you know, should there be an LLM in every room? Right. And for the, for the same reason, right. Should there, should there be like a, a you know, a bot in the chair? Um, of course. Right. It's, well. <laughs> you see, of course, nobody is actually doing that today. I've not heard of a single instance of anybody doing that. They all could be doing that today. Yeah. You know, actually voice, voice recognition is getting really good and what they call disambiguation is getting really good. So you have systems now that can do real time transcripts or group conversations, which means you could be feeding it to an LLM and have it be weighing in. You know, five years from now, we could be sitting here and everybody's doing it. How does your background as a software engineer show up in your writing? That's a good question. I, I would like to say software is itself a literary genre. Um, hmm. the, the, you, you write software code as, as, as prose. I got a D minus in computer science. And actually, so I slept through my final. I showed up an hour, 15 minutes late. And I got a D minus going to office hours and trying. I totally failed the class, but the professor definitely felt sorry for me and bumped me up to a D minus. So like when you talk about software engineering, like... Break it down for me, man. So do you still have nightmares? I have other nightmares okay. about tests and all. I actually you, not were, that one. you know, you were the reason that college was ruined for me because I was in North Carolina and I went to these lectures that weren't very good. And I kid you not, I promise I'm not just blowing smoke. I used to go back to my room and I'd be like, why would I go to a lecture with some random professor if I could read your tweets in my room? And then I ended up finding YouTube. And actually, that was part of the thing that set me on this journey of saying, hey, you can use the internet to learn. And then I was like, wait, this is a two-way medium. You can use the internet to write, meet people. And that was like the greatest thing in the world for me. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's fun like that. And that's the, both of those realities are still hanging out there. And we still have this giant education system that doesn't take that into account. Yeah. And we still have this giant, you know, publishing system that doesn't take this into account. So the world is not adapted yet, you know. To, to, to either of the uh, of those aspects. Um, so, so the way to think about software, and the, the, I, I think this is a very interesting topic. Um, writing software is like a combination of writing a novel and building a bridge. 
like and at the same time, right? Um, and 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 start by saying it's not the same thing as building a bridge. And one of the ways you know it's not the same thing as building a bridge um, is that if software people uh, built a bridge, you would never want to drive on that bridge, hmm. right? Like every piece of software that has ever shipped in the history of the world has bugs. Right. Move fast and break things is not what you want to do for the Brooklyn Bridge. Exactly right. So it's not civil engineering. It's not that kind of civil engineering, which is to say, and, and there's a reason for it. It's not just because software people are like bad at engineering or lazy or whatever, don't want to get things right. It's because there's a creative element to it that is just missing from things like building bridges. Um, and, and again, not that building bridges isn't creative in a way, but like the cr- creativity of building a bridge is going to be an initial design. The implementation of the bridge is going to be making sure it doesn't fall over. Sure. And whereas with software, you're, you're kind of creating all the way through. Huh. Right? It's just, it, and, 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 the, and the creative part of it is, is so there is a structural part, like the, the software actually has to work structurally, but it is like writing a novel, right? Or like painting a painting, which is like different, basically, you know, different, different, different. It, 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 it needs to be a form of creative expression and the best programmers are, are very good at doing that. And so, so, so it's the, it's the, it's this hybrid thing. So, so the way to think about it is this right brain and left brain, quantitative and qualitative. Probably not a coincidence that Paul Graham wrote a book called Hackers and Painters. That's exactly right. So it is that. Um, and then the specific form of what you're doing is you are literally writing, right? Um, you are literally writing code in the same way that you would write a poem or the same way that you would write an outline, right? It, it, it's structured writing. And so, it, it, you know, there's a certain format for it and so forth. It's like, you know, think the little semicolons have to go in the right places. But yeah, you do write it. And then, by the way, as you write it, you, you comment it, right? And so you, you actually interleave English language descriptions. Yes. Uh, and then what, what's happened is programming languages have evolved um, where um, they're getting higher and higher level over time, which means you're, you're getting more and more out of the details of like how the computer works and you're getting into these kind of higher level abstractions um, that let the programmer basically become more productive. And now you've got a giant change happening in real time, which is the new coding. The old coding interface was your code and then you run it and then you see where all the bugs are and you try to fix the bugs. The new coding interface is you've got your code and then you've got a chatbot. Mm-hmm. You got the, the copilot and, yep. and the copilot is like reading your code and like giving you like real time comments on like, you know, you idiot, you, you got this wrong. Right. Um, or the chat bot is actually writing the code for you and then you're giving it feedback. Yeah. You know, you idiot, you got this wrong. Yeah. Right. Um, and so now you've got this concept, we had this old concept in the old days called pair programming where you'd put two coders together in front of the same keyboard and they could talk to each other and kind of write code together. Now you're going to have pair. And that was always a rare thing because most people didn't do that, but now you're just gonna have pair programming happening much more broadly, which is human plus machine. And by the way, I think this, this hasn't happened yet, but I think the same thing is going to happen for every other form of writing. Yeah. Right. So I think prose writing and fiction writing and everything else in the future, I think most professional authors are going to be uh, working in that kind of format. And, and, and you'll kind of, you'll have this continuous dialogue going with an AI at the same time that you're, you're, you're you know, that you yourself are, are, are in charge of the overall product. Well, I think it's not a coincidence that Silicon Valley's contribution to writing culture has been density and very good logical arguments if you're used to writing code you are used to thinking of writing a structure well honestly probably that's why i think in terms of outlines um is because code effectively takes the form of an outline did you teach yourself to code or learn to code i taught myself to code i taught myself to code out of a book before i owned a computer <laughs> what <laughs> yes so that's how i knew when i was yeah when i was like 10 when i because i my I'm, I'm of the age where i was i i sort of hit adolescence right as the computer became a thing um, and so I, I, I basically discovered computers, the computers are all over the news, but like people didn't have them. <laughs> they didn't like, you know, PCs yeah. didn't like exist yet. They were That's why you went to urbana Champagne, Just rolling right? ultimately, yeah, later on, ultimately, but now I'm talking about like 1980, 1981. So when I was like, you know, nine, 10, 11, you know, it's kind of when the media, media wave hit. And it was like when Apple became a big thing and all, all the, you know, Steve Jobs was on the cover of everything at the time, uh, you know, as a kid. Uh, and then, you know, I'm like 10 or whatever. And like, there's no computer anywhere than like, you know, a hundred miles of where I was. Um, but there was a, a book in the library that was like, learn how to code. It's like, okay, sounds good. And so on the bus ride, all, you know, <laughs> all day, all morning and all night, you know, um, driving to and from school, I'd be sitting in the back, reading the book and writing code. Were you good at writing in school? Uh, well, I, this, this school, this school I knew there was not a lot of writing in the school I went to. Um, so I, I don't even think. What kind of school did you go to? I, like uh, writing is pretty standard. A rural, a rural public school. Okay. Yes. Uh, in the middle of nowhere. So not, 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 not a lot of, not a lot of test cases on that, but, um, but, um, uh, yeah, no. And I just, I always love, you know, it's just for, for people who are oriented towards puzzles, people who like have a systems orientation to things like are comfortable with the idea of like systems and structures and, 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 you know, and math and things like that, but also people who don't just want to do that, right? People who would be very unhappy if they were just like an actuary or account or something they, where they also want to have the creative element and are able to do that. And so it's, it's a hybrid of the two. So what's the binding constraint on you writing more? Don't tell me time, time. because that, no, no, no. 
No, I'm telling you, actually, that's not true. Okay. Because you wrote software engineering the world really fast, and you wrote it's time to build really fast. So it can't be time. So yeah, so I've been, uh, yeah, this is a perpetual project. If you have so much to do list, this is a perpetual project. Like I should be writing more. And I am working on something right now. So nice. Well, here's what I would say though there are writers in history who do really well by writing every single day. And then there's other writers who it just comes out of them. Uh, the woman who wrote Frankenstein, she was like on a trip in Switzerland and she had a dream and it just went and it just poured out. So I think that time, I'm just not sure that that's actually the binding constraint. That's very good feedback. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> performance, performance feedback. <laughs> I just, it's very inspiring. I deal with a couple hundred students a year who just try to give me every single excuse that they possibly can. And I, it's just literally my job to be like, that's ah, not the best. Okay. Experience. I'll tell you the thing that has tortured me the most on the writing topic and of everything. Gonna... So I had the privilege one day, several years back, of spending a day with a guy named David Milch, who is the writer. Um, uh, he's, um, he's a television film writer, um, Deadwood. On oh, HBO nice. is probably his like magnum opus, but he's you know a legendary guy who's like done, done, done all these things. He's one of the best living. He's been one of the best living fiction writers. Um, and I spent the day with him, and um, and he at the end of the day he's, he he gave me one of those looks, um, and he's like, "You should be writing fiction." Oh wow! And it never even occurred to me to write fiction. I've never even tried to write fiction. Um, <laughs> but every time I make my list of things that I should do at some point in my life. I feel like I need to try to do that. I feel like you could write a TV show or a movie. Yeah. He, he, well, yeah, I, I, it would have never occurred to me, but yeah, it was one of those, it was like a voice of God moment where it's yeah. like, okay, if that guy's telling you, you should try it, you kind of have an obligation to try it. So I do have an idea. Okay. Here's what I really want to write. Here's what yes, I really want to write. There we go. Okay. Here's, here's what I really want to write. I want to write a Romana clap. What is that? Romana clef is a novel in which, um, all of the names and dates and events are fictional. But everything that happens in it actually happened in real life. Um, and so it's the everything was it's like a laundered autobiography or memoir, right? Um, and so there are various examples. Uh, a TV version of a Romana Clef would be the if you've seen the show Ray Donovan. It is a, it's a show about a Hollywood fixer, uh, a guy who goes around and like fixes problems for studios with like all these you know, everything screwed up in Hollywood. And, and the, 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 it's a fictional show, but the legend has it is that every single situation he fixes in the show is something that actually happened in Hollywood at some point. Um, and so, um, yeah, I, you know, but you know, you know, 30, 30 years now in tech, like I've seen a lot of stuff <laughs> and I'm never going to write it. I would never, ever write a tell all, uh, and I would never like, you know, basically launder people out, um, you know, by name or in any way that's identifiable, but I've seen a lot of crazy stuff. And so my, my, so here's one, one of my, one of my crazy ideas is like, basically just like write down every crazy thing I've ever seen and then, and then weave it into a fictional narrative. So, so anyway, if, if the, maybe this, if, if I ever publish a novel, every single thing in it will have actually happened. <laughs> you heard it here first. <laughs> exactly. Well, this is funny because this picks up on one of the paradoxes that I've noticed about you, which is on one hand, an intense privacy, and on another hand, a desire to be prolific and in public. I mean, look, the nature of what we do, it turns out it matters. Like people care. And, you know, sometimes they get really happy <laughs> with the results. Sometimes they get really upset. Um, you know, look, the drama in the tech industry is like wildly up over the time. You know, you know, when I became involved in the tech industry, like it, it, everything was all cute and fun, right? All the new products, you know, like the press coverage for all the new products are like, wow, this thing is really great. Or, you know, boy, this product isn't as good, but maybe the next one will be good. And now, you know, you, you know, it's just like everything. It's just like, you know, we, we now intersect into every area of human life and all the big issues that people are worried about. Two things. One quick comment. Someone should write a book that is like Tim Wu's book about information centralization, decentralization about what you're saying about the different creative mediums. Free call to write that book. Next thing, how much internal writing do you do at A16? Just send your a lot. So what form does that take? For me, writing, it's a lot of emails, a lot of, uh, and a lot of text, a lot of the art of the text message. Um, uh, but we, you know, we, we, we process lots of written material. Um, and, and every once in a while, I'll write something long form here. If I'm writing something long form here, it's usually like around a new initiative, like or like a or like a, a, a topic where there's like serious conflict or ambiguity, and I'm trying to kind of write down in a single place, like here's you know here are the different considerations, and here's maybe what we should do about it. So I do that once in a while. So that's like an internal version of the essays. Tell me more about your actual writing there. Do you have a process for that? That's similar as your writing take a different form when you're doing that. Do you feel like your writing is better in a certain way than 
than when it's in public. Tell me about that. I think it's the same thing. Same thing. I actually think it's the same thing. And it's, it's the same thing. If, if I'm writing that, it's because something is coming to a head. Like there's an issue, right? And it's either there's a problem we need to fix or there's an opportunity we need to jump on. But that will, at the, at the time that I'm writing, it follows probably some long period of discussion that's happened. And it's been kind of rattling around here for a while. And then it's time to like get it out in, a, in, a, in, a, in the form of an artifact. Well, by the way, one of the things I've observed, maybe this is, I don't, it's the kind of thing where I feel like everybody knows this and yet nobody, very few people actually act on it, or maybe people don't know it, which is like the person who writes down the thing has tremendous power, huh? independent of their actual formal role in an organization or in the world. There are so few people who will just like write down the thing. Um, and so th- I, I see, we see this at companies all the time, which is, you know, w- one of the ways you find like the up and comers at a tech company is just like, okay, who wrote down? the plan. And you know, that doesn't mean they came up with everything. And that doesn't mean that they had all the ideas, but like they're actually able to organize their thoughts and then actually have the energy and the motivation, the skill to be able to communicate in their written form. Like that, that actually stands out. And you would think that that was, I, was, I would always kind of assume everybody would know that, but like the number of people who will actually write anything down in a, in a you know, like in, 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 you know, with that requisite level of like comprehensiveness and quality. I mean, even in a meeting, note taking is low, is low status. I think if I, yeah, if I were, is, I, I don't know if I had this in my career, career planning or not, but yeah, this is part of my standard, maybe it's part of my standard advice to kids, which is just like, no, be the person in the meeting who voluntarily like takes notes and then writes up the summary at the end. And, fa- and, and then fa- you have to fairly represent everything. If you're junior, you know, the artist, you have to fairly represent everything. I mean, the other thing is say that some rando wanted to get to you. If they wrote you a very well written email, I would say that the chances of you reading that are 100%. Now, I don't want to like flood your inbox and stuff like that, but actually, maybe that's my goal. Like, what if we 100x the number of extremely well written emails that came to your inbox? Contrarian perspective, domain expertise, well written, chances you're going to read that are at least 90, right? Yeah. 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 It's, very, it's very rare. What's going on? That seems like a market inefficiency. So, so works. I think there's a broader topic here, which is just like, I mean, you can, you can spend all day long consuming badly written you know, text and content. I think all the time, if I see an old book, I think this only exists, like a really old book. It had to be written. And then in order for there to be another copy, somebody needed to write the entire book down. I mean, rabbis do this now with writing the whole Torah by hand, but that's how books used to be. Now you just go command A, command C, command V, send it off, and then you can send it to a bunch of people. And so it's like, it's gotten too easy to write now. Exactly. So, so here's the, here's the paradox. Here's the paradox. It's now so easy to write that we are absolutely awash in bad content. Like the world is just awash in bad blog posts, bad tweets, bad books, bad laws, bad text code, bad everything. Like it's just, we could spend all day long just drowning in bad content. And, you know, and a lot of, and a lot of us do. On the other hand, like it ought to be, these tools are now so effective that there ought to be a giant explosion of high quality content that goes right along with that. We, we ought to also be awash in like the most amazing written material that we've ever seen in an entire lives in every genre. Yeah. So the other side of it is like, where's all the good stuff? Yeah. Like where are the, where are the, you know, super genius brainiac authors, screenwriters, novelists who are producing like a much larger amount of material at much higher speed? I mean, that's the, that's the reason for my work is trying to create those people. It just seems crazy to me that the internet in some sense has created a flowering of new content, but it still seems hard to find. And I still just feel like at the absolute tales of quality, it should be a hundred X more. Exactly. Right. Exactly. Because all those people can email you and you're going to read it. And it just, it seems like a weird inefficiency. Uh, I think you're the guy to ask about this. Why are hyperlinks blue? Because I like blue. <laughs> Is that why? Yes. It's a nice, firm color. It's easy to see. Well, so what's the story here? You're sitting in an office. Well, it, had and to be, like, it had to be some color. <laughs> What'd you do? You just had to go into the HEX code and you wrote six well, numbers this is, um, and at letters? The time, so at the time we were doing this, you know, uh, I was trying to forget, it's like a lot, of comp- a lot of graphics computers at that time only had 256 total colors. They had some eight, eight, eight bit color, color, eight bit color palette, um, and so you can kind of see all two hundred fifty six colors, and it's kind of like take your take your pick. And so they could have been salmon, yeah, <laughs> right, or right, yellow. I mean, they had, they had to be something that like actually stood out on the page, yeah. Um, and so it was basically going to be blue, red, purple, green. I don't like those other colors. <laughs> <laughs> That's crazy. By the by the way, I also I didn't quite get this across. The other thing I did was I don't like reading text on white backgrounds because my my I, my eyes are a little sensitive to light. 
Um, and so the, if you look, look at early Mosaic and Netscape, the, the backgrounds are always gray. And so it was black text on gray backgrounds. And I used to get a lot of black for that. But what I, but I, was, what I, was, what I really wanted was dark mode. Um, but I couldn't get there at that point because the displays weren't good enough to do black. It, it, white text on black backgrounds back then was hard to read because you didn't have enough shades of gray and you couldn't quite get the, you, you, you didn't, have, didn't have screen resolution to have that be a appealing thing. What's your read on why there's been such stagnation in the quality of comment sections? <laughs> at this point you're asking very fundamental questions about human nature you sort of invented the internet so i'm oh. like if i'm gonna have a a day where yeah. i could ask these questions it but it's sort of because like, you know, the equivalent question of what the one you just asked is why are there so lo- so many low quality commenters which is which is a yeah. human condition question so the serious answer is to start give the devil his due so like i will tell you like reddit uh i'll call it a, th- a few a few counter a few things where i think comments actually were, i think reddit comments work incredibly well um, and I think those guys figured out like a you know, long time ago, but like, you know, Steve and Alexis figured out like a formula, a, a way to do that with the karma system that like works like incredibly well. Like, I think that works really well. I actually have been really positively surprised by YouTube comments. I don't know if whether you have this experience, but like for at least a lot of YouTube videos I watch, actually, they do a good job of surfacing quality contents, bearing the bad stuff. Um, I think the Twitter algorithm actually has gotten a lot better over the years. You need some sort of consciously calibrated system to evaluate service quality. By the way, LLMs also should help with this because LLMs are very good at evaluating text. Um, and so you should, people should, this is probably true, this is already happening, but people should be running, you know, if you're building a commenting system, you should let the LLM evaluate it. And you, and you can do it even, you can just ask LLMs, like, is this text good? But you could also say, like, look, like, what's the emotional loading on the text? The LLM could tell you is, is, you know, is a comment angry or happy or whatever. And you could say, you know, submerge, you know, you can basically say bury the ones that are angry. Um, and so I actually think it's pretty good. Um, on, look, on the systems that, um, you know, on the systems that don't do that consciously, you just have a, you know, you just, you just drown under all the, all the, all the, all the bad stuff. The missing feature that doesn't exist on the web that we almost got in, but didn't, weren't able to get in. So the missing feature was going to be a writing, a writing layer, a commenting layer on top of web pages. Um, oh, wow. And we actually prototyped it. We had it actually in the original version of Mosaic. And we, we called it annotations. Uh, and the idea was basically, the idea basically was every web page, you know, we, we, the web is inherently an asynchronous medium. So you, you or I are reading a page. We're probably reading it at different times at different pages, whenever. But every now and then we might be on there at the same time. Um, or you might've been on there yesterday and you might've had an interesting thought and maybe you should have had the ability to add your thought to that. Right. And, and if, the, if that, if that, if that, if that's happening in the f- format of the page itself, you would call that like a wiki or a, or a comment section. But we had, we had this idea that there should be like an overlay. There should be like basically a commenting system overlay on top of the entire web at, at, implemented in the browser. Right. And so then literally you could be looking at a web page and either us at the same time or at different times. You know, the fact that we're both looking at it, each of us could then post, right, commentary on top of that, that, that everybody else could see. And maybe there'd actually be multiple layers of commentary. And so, and we actually built a, we built a, what I call the, uh, the annotation server, uh, which was going to be the central repository of all the annotations on top of all the web pages. And what happened? That was a big thing to bite off because the annotation server was going to have to scale to cover the entire web. Slightly sizable project. Yes, exactly. Right. Um, uh, and so, and then there was all this UI stuff. And so it's, it's just the feature that we never got to. Um, but there, there is a funny how these things evolve there, there is a on earth two um there are there's an there's there's an entirely different writing environment how has online writing morphed in a way that's different from what you would have expected 20 years ago the degree to which internet writing is the forum now in which politics plays out is just mind-blowing um and for a very long time that was not the case um and if you wanted to find, like when you know like people had political discussions on the internet and in like the even the eighties and nineties on Usenet, but it was like isolated in like some weird Usenet group where they were just talking about that. But like if you were in like a, a any other, if you were in like I don't know the the the, the Cats Usenet group or the you know San Francisco Bay Area Usenet group or whatever, nobody ever brought up political topics. It was just like a it was just like a whole. You know, of course, you wouldn't do that. Um, it would have been a considered rude to do it. Um, and then it's, it's a f- switch was flipped in like, I don't know, 2015, maybe 2014, 2013, where all of a sudden it's just like everybody just starts infusing politics and everything. And I think part of that was just an external thing that happened, which is the, we just went into a different political realm, um, unrelated to the internet or, you know, not, not, not just the, the, the something external happened that then changed. What- like in the Martin Gurry sense? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Like just the world changed. And so therefore everything changed. And so therefore this is one of the things that changed. But I, uh, but I also think, look, the other thing that happened was the internet just became central. Like the, the, the internet just became the place where people do everything and read about everything and learn about everything and argue about everything. 
And so part, part of it is I think the dog caught the bus, right? Like we wanted to be central to people's lives and then we became central to people's lives. And it turns out one of the things that, one of the things that is central to people's lives is politics. So if the internet became central in, in lives, it was necessarily going to become hyper-political and all internet content was going to become hyper-political, which is you know, a lot of what basically has happened. And I like that, 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 you know, I would say that was, as, again, maybe just night. That was as big a shock to me as it was anybody else. I, I kind of couldn't believe it was happening when it was happening just because I was so used to the older model. Do you ever read for style or do you only read for content? Um, in practice, I would say I only read for content. That said, it is always really fun. I'm re reading for content and I come across somebody who is writing with outstanding style. It, it is amazing how much it still punches through. I, I, I like, I'll just give you an example. I like, but I like, I read a lot of biographies. Um, and so I just read the, the Teddy Roosevelt biographies by Ed, Edmund Morris. Oh, I've heard great things about those. Yeah. And like, Carol probably still is maybe one notch, but like Edmunds, uh, Morris is like one notch below Carol, which is, which is to say like one of the best in history. Right. right. And, and just the, 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 you know, the stylistic quality of the writing, I mean, I'm listening to another one right now that I, I won't, I won't name cause I don't want to insult him, but like, you know, it's, it's very good. I've been listening to a very good biography on a different president right now, but, um, it's not, you can just tell the stylistic fall off is like dramatic. You, you just, you kind of wish like, you know, boy, like, well, this goes back to the LLM topic, right? Which is you kind of wish. Like in theory, all writing could be like that. What are the things about style that are really enchanting to you? It's just like every single sentence word, every the deliberate the deliberate choice of every single sentence word structure. Is it the vibrancy, the poetry? What is it? The it's I, I, maybe it's something like computer science thing. It's a lot of for me. It's like stru it's like structural. It's like it's like everything flows exactly right. He spends exactly the right amount of time on each topic. Um, it has exactly the right amount of detail. Uh, it uses exactly the right words. <laughs> it, it, it creates the exactly the right emotion. Um, and it's just this like incredible, it's, it's, it's actually, I'll tell you the experience I usually have, which is, you know, most of what I read, I would say is it's, it's great. It's professional, but it's not, you know, it's not Robert Carroll level or, or uh, Tom Wolf level. But then every once in a while, I'll stumble on something that really is at that level. And it'll remind me that it actually is possible to write at that level. And then it's, and then it's just like, yeah, it's just like, that's, it, it's an amazing experience while you're in it. And then that ends and you're just kind of like, well, I got to go back to <laughs> so the work, workman like prose, you know, which is, which is a lot more common artists, right? Like there are just I, I, certain I people who are at the top of their artists, games, right? Like yeah. they're just certain people who are at the top of their game. What? Uh, James Elroy. Who's that? James Elroy. I have no idea who oh that is. Oh my God. All right. Good. Okay. Good. I'm glad I can do this. I don't you. even know what that is. Oh, so he's the, he's, I think he's the greatest living American novelist. Uh, his the genre is crime novels, but that's a little bit like saying Shakespeare did love stories. It under, it, uh, Elroy, El, Elroy is writing a series of novels that basically are turning 20th century American history into myth. Um, and, uh, his most, so his most famous work is LA Confidential, um, which you may have seen, or seen the movie. You haven't seen the movie. Okay. <laughs> New world for me, Mr. Andreessen. LA Confidence, it's a movie set in, uh, in, uh, in LA. Uh, it's a crime movie set in LA in the 1950s. Um, Russell Crowe and, and all these, all these great actors. Um, uh, and so the, the movie's great and I won Oscars and did great. And then the novel LA Confidential is like 20 X more expansive. It's just like this incredible kaleidoscopic recreation of Los Angeles history. And, uh, in the 1950s, he, he wrote a recent novel called Perfidia. Um, he's, he has a new quartet he's writing, um, about the 1940s. He's actually going back in time as he gets older. Um, but, uh, Perfidia is one of his more recent novels and it is, a, it's like a thousand pages, incredible detail. Um, but it's the story of what it was like in Los Angeles the week after the bombing of Pearl Harbor. And that is, is very significant because it, it, they thought they were next. It, like in real life, they thought they were next. Like they, they thought literally LA was like the next target and the Japanese bombers were going to show up at any moment and like destroy the city. And so the, the whole city went into like an incredible, like a, just a complete, like paranoia, you know, just like complete freak out. Right. And then of course, also America was obviously at that point, then you had to enter world war two. Um, and so that was the, you know, that was their origination of like the Japanese, that was when the Japanese internment camp program was developed. And so it was like this incredibly potent, intense period of time. And he creates this sense of like being there. Uh, and if you read interviews with how he works, um, he doesn't, he's one of these guys, doesn't own a computer. He still writes on a typewriter. Yeah. Um, he lives, he lives in the, he like, he very deliberately tries to live in his, in his time era. So he like, he still goes to the library and like pulls like microfilm, like newspapers in the 1940s. I like that line creates a sense of being there. Yeah. Yeah. Like you get a sense of like, okay, this is really, well, I mentioned David Mills before I, he does this. Like if, if you watch Deadwood, you're like, okay, this, I, I think I'm finally seeing what it was like to be at like you know the old west in like 1860 like this is really what it was like and like you know the mud yeah <laughs> and the stench and the 
you know, and people desperately trying to hold on to their dignity. I'm surprised that you haven't mentioned science fiction because as a kid, that's a huge influence on you. Yeah. So what changes? I don't know. Maybe it's just, there's so much in real history. Like, like with science fiction, I mean, by definition, science fiction is speculative. And so you're, 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 you know, you've got novelists doing their best to kind of predict how real people act, but in history, real people actually acted. Right. And like so many, like just incredible bananas, bizarre, you know, both incredibly good and incredibly bad things happen in history and people made such great decisions and terrible decisions. You know, another good, good thing that uh, David Mills does in Deadwood along these lines is like everybody's drunk all the time. Right. And, and it's, and if you go back, it's actually been worked on on this. It turns out like in the American South and, 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 uh, West, uh, and back to the colonial era, people used to drink 4X more alcohol per capita than they do today. Wow. And, and part of it was they couldn't get clean water. Um, and so you would roll out of bed and start drinking beer. And so people were just like hammered around the clock. And so, and then they wonder why they would get in all these fights, right? And all these horrible things would happen and they'd be making these terrible judgments and be getting in all these. And it's like a lot of it was they were just drunk, yeah, but you have to, you have to have somebody who takes you by the hand and like makes it clear what that was actually like. Cause it's not something that you can experience yourself. What's your read on how different kinds of drugs like weed, wine, beer, how they influence writing and creativity? Well, I think they influence like the entirety of culture. I, so I, I think, I think it was a, to start with, I just think they, they influence everything, right? And so the, the, the classic example of this was the cutover actually started, I think in England, the cutover from alcohol to tea and then coffee, caffeine was like, it, basically that was the catalytic event. The, it was the chemical catalyst literally for the enlightenment, uh, right? And then, and then actually led to the development of financial markets. Uh, financial markets actually started around basically like coffee houses. What? Do you know Lloyd's of London? So yes, I've heard an insurance it. company, yeah. right? So and it's it's it's, it's it, and, and and so Lloyd's London was one of the first like professional insurance companies. It was literally just a group of people who would meet at a coffee shop, um, and they would basically just like underwrite policies. And then a lot of like early scientific discovery was people would meet at coffee coffee houses and, and like exchange these things, and they would get together. And you know, it's American whaling industry. It was all over. People would be hanging out at the coffee house at the pub. And, same with out. Paris. Yeah, right. Exactly. All the literary salons, and then ultimately like political, you know, revolutionary, you know, salons, um, all that stuff. And so, so you've got these kind of, you've, you've, you know, basically everything interesting that happens. You know, there's some group of people who come together and, and are interacting with each other and trying to figure things out. And if they're all drunk, <laughs> that leads to one set of conclusions and activities. And if they're all like buzzed on, you know caffeine you ever seen hunter s thompson's daily routine yes exactly right exactly yeah exactly 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 it's yeah. crazy yeah, it's yeah, like yeah. wake up at 3 15 you know drink have whiskey snort cocaine and he just and then he starts at like 2 a.m starts writing yeah. exactly right exactly well or another version of that is i have i ran so i ran so she was on benzodrine for 30 years the, the amphetamine um in the high, high potency amphetamine um essentially meth um and and, and, it, and it has long-term consequences like it actually like over time it actually like degrades your judgment um, and then in our era, right, um, in our era, of course, alcohol is still a major factor, but also we have withdrawn nicotine, yeah. which is a stimulant, right? And so there's there's all these very interesting questions about rising obesity levels and, and dropping testosterone levels. And there's a fair number of people who think that those are both consequences of the decline in smoking. Yes. You withdraw nicotine, you get those side effects. Um, and then you're pulling energy out of the system. And then especially if you're if you're replacing nicotine with pot, you're going back it's, in this context, you're going backwards because you're replacing a stimulant with a depressant. Right. Right. So it's almost like you're reverting back to more of what it was like when everybody was drunk all the time. Right. Except now everybody's high all the time. What do you like about green tea? Um, it's a, it's a, it's a, um, it's a way to deliver the right amount of caffeine. Um, if I drink, uh, diet Coke or full coffee, um, I get over cranked. <laughs> diet Coke. Yeah. Yeah. So I need a, I need a, I need a continuous feed of the right. I need to not let if I, if I drink the amount of caffeine I would like to drink, I start skipping heartbeats. Ah. And so that I shouldn't. So continuous. So how many of these do you have a day? I don't know. Yeah, all the time. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. Nice. Yeah. Tell me about your office. It seems like you love this place. And the funniest thing about it is you stack books. You don't put them on shelves. Yeah. So I, I yeah. I, at some point I should get like shelves made. So I just ordered. But I, you have it. Like. I know. I, I order books all the time. But what's going on? I, I, I just think it's an interesting thing that has sort of emerged here. So basically when I, when I, when I, when I start, when I started to make money, I basically just decided I'm just going to buy every book I think I'm ever going to want to read. Just like, I'm just reflexively going to just buy all the books, buy all the books. Um, and so I just constantly have like books showing up. Um, and then, yeah, in theory, I should, I should have some kind of system for that. I don't. So they just pile up. It's cool. It's the, a goal, vibe. the goal is just keep, yeah, keep the piles relatively. Yeah, it seems like you like this place. Relatively <laughs> organized. I mean, I'm just, I'm just imagining you're a night owl, so you have this really cool home office, and then that's where you would do your writing. 
Yeah, basically. Yeah. What makes for a good home office? Books. Books. <laughs> I don't know. I like <laughs> books, green tea, uh, music. I, you know, I like listening to music. Um, what kind like of music you listen almost to? Almost always um, uh, on headphones these days. Um, so I, li- I like I like a lot of different kinds of music. Um, especially, especially, I like cl- a lot of classical music. I like jazz. Um, I like a lot of uh, it, it, a lot of different kinds of like, different kinds of rock. But for writing, it's what I've actually been doing recently is on on YouTube in particular, um, like uh, synthwave or um, is this uh, genre called future garage uh, or lo- or that always lo fi. So like trying to get music that is like the right level of interestingness, where it gets the buzzing part of the brain to be stable but is not distracting. Yeah. Uh, Philip Glass. Yeah. If I really want to get in the mood. Are you a song on repeat kind of guy? Uh, no, no, no. I would get too frustrated. Um, okay. But yeah, but like. I like the trance. Okay. All right. Okay. Yeah. Same song. I listened to the same song like 45 times yeah. yesterday. Yeah. It's great. Yeah. But it's got to be, it, it can't have a, in my, in my experience, it can't have a song with that much. There can't be that much going on in the song or it starts to get old and then it starts to get annoying. So yeah, something with like a consistent beat. How do you think walking working out influences your creativity uh i don't think, I don't think <laughs> not that. at all i don't think so really i have all these friends who you know go on go, go on meeting walks i don't really do that um when i when i when i when i'm on the treadmill i'm watching tv um sometimes i'm on twitter but yeah I, that's why it's that disconnection time for me like once i get my heart rate up going to walk that for me it's like my best creative time I don't think so. You know, that's on Nietzsche wrote, you know, eight hours a day. You know, he would walk eight hours a day in the mountains. And I think literally that's why his books are just like essays, aphorisms, essays, aphorisms is because he would just like write in his notebook for a year and then bundle it up in a book and ship it out the door. What do you think we could learn from your partner, Ben, about writing? Oh, so he's an actual, unlike, he's an actual successful. A real writer here. He's yeah. an actual successful <laughs> <laughs> professional writer. Okay, so now we get to now yeah, now we get to actually <laughs> the podcast begins now. It begins actually yeah. becomes useful. Oh, this was all a preamble into the, into, into, into the good part. So Ben Ben has a Ben has a number of of, uh, of of great traits for this. So one is his father was a very success is a very successful professional author. So his oh so his father is a guy named David Horowitz um, who is a very um, he's been a very active political writer activist. Um, he, he's sort of a famous character in American politics because he was on the far left in the nineteen sixties. He was one of the creators of what was called the Berkeley Free Speech Movement, which was sort of the birth of the hippie movement and the anti-war movement in 1964 in Berkeley. And then uh, David actually was a fundraiser for the Black Panther Party uh, in Oakland when they were like the when they were like a very a potent force in American politics. And then in the and then he was so he was very active. He was one of the leaders. He he ran a magazine called Ramparts, which was like the big magazine of the of the radical left in the in the 70s in the 60s and 70s. And so he was like a liter. He was so when Ben was a kid, like his father's business was was writing and he was writing books and running a magazine. And then in the eighties, David went hard, right? Um, and so he signed up for the Reagan revolution and then he has sort of moved further and further to the right over time. And he's not like a very enthusiastic Trump supporter. So he's kind of done the whole, done the whole arc. Um, and so Ben's, Ben's, Ben's reaction to that has been in two forms. One is Ben is as non-political as you can possibly get. Uh, ben, Ben's conclusion from watching his father is stay out of politics. And, and Ben's father really enjoyed it, but was always leaning into controversy and was always getting people mad at him. And so ben, Ben's very non-political by, by orientation, uh, which is why he ended up in business. Um, but David was always writing um, and has written, probably has written 40 books and, and probably, you know, an infinite number of, David's one of those guys who's like published entire series of like his, like, you know, assembled essays. Oh, his autobiography is called Radical Son, which is a fantastic book, which talks about this whole journey that he went on. That's a, it's a great book. Um, so, so Ben grew up, um, you know, kind of with his father doing that. And then specifically his father in the seventies wrote three bestsellers, which were non-political, which were biographies. And it was biographies of the Fords, the Rockefellers and the Kennedys, uh, family biographies. And actually Ben was a research assistant when he was a kid, all those books. So, uh, Ben met, uh, 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 Bobby Kennedy Jr. Who's running for president right now. So Ben met him in the 1970s when Ben was like 15, um, when, uh, when, uh, when, uh, and that when Bobby Kennedy was in the news for a lot of stuff that you can find on his Wikipedia page. Um, <laughs> so, so he just, he's just, yeah. So he's just always, you know, li- you know, from a literary family. Um, yeah. And then he, you know, he decided for, we, we did our, our, our company, we did together, loud cloud. Um, you know, he, he had enough kind of, <laughs> he had enough sort of assemble scar tissue, uh, to have enough material for a book. Um, and, uh, and that went really, and that went really well. And he, he cracked the code. This is one of the things I always think about a lot. Like, you know, look, there's a lot of people who write like business books or, you know, how-to books or coaching mentoring books of different kinds, but most of them come and go. 
but every once in a while you get one that just like sells basically forever, right? And Peter's Peter Thiel's book Zero to One is like that. And Ben's book, The Hard Thing About Hard Things, is like that thing just like sells. And gets translated into, you know, you say like in like 27 languages now or something and sells all, all over the world. What would he say about your writing as if he was your coach? My coach? Uh, I you know, the it, as, <laughs> this is actually okay, I can tell you exactly what he would say. Um, so, uh, he's, so I'm working on a thing right now. I'm working on a big, I'm working for me, a big thing right now. Um, the manifesto, the big thing, um, it'd probably be 30, 40 pages. Um, but for me, that, for me, that's big. Um, but, but I am, I am behind schedule. Um, and so he referred to me the other day as the Kanye of blog post writers. I'm getting a head nod over there about behind schedule. It's the first time I got a reaction to yes. the entire interview. So I was, it was supposed to be out by now, um, but I've been kind of, I, I, I have a very high bar on this one. I wanted to nice. actually like stand up to time. Wanted to rip. Yeah. And so, um, uh, I'm, I'm behind, I'm behind on my, my, my self-imposed schedule. Um, and certain people around here who might be in this room are very frustrated. Um, but Ben said, Ben said, what are you talking about? You're the Kanye of writing blog posts. Right. In other words, well, no, no, by the way, this is, he's, by the way, he's referencing like Kanye before. Sure, sure, yes, sure. I'm yes. still trying to figure out Kanye means a lot of different things. So what does that mean? I think in, in, in Ben speak, that means um, it, it's going to take the time it's going to take and then it's, it's going to be, but then it's going to be, it's yes. going to be good. Yes. It, you know, when yeah. it comes out, it's going to be creatively, it's going to be good. So I, I took that as a compliment. What would your writing be missing right now? Oh, so for this one, for this one, I'm trying to have it. This one's this one is like this one's like philosophy. This one's like trying to argue argue for a philosophy, right? So, so on a, on an important topic, like how to, how to think about a very, a very important thing in the world. Um, and so, um, it, it's it's a, it's on it's on technology. It's a philosophy of basically technology. Um, and um, there's just there have been a lot of very smart people for a very long time who have been thinking about and writing about that topic. The role of technology in society has been something that like a lot of people have thought about. Um, and I've, and I've read a lot of, you know, I've, I've read their stuff, but like it's, there's a lot of content there and there's a lot of arguments there. Yeah. Right. And there's, you know, I'd say there's both good and bad arguments for technology being both good and bad in society. Um, and so, um, I wanted to, I, I want to basically for any, anybody who like knows all of that or is doing that today, when they read this, I want them to think, okay, I may or may not agree with him, but he at least understands the topic. Yep. He's, he's read it all. Yes. He's processed it all. He's yeah. responding to the actual arguments that people make as opposed to, you know, skipping it or not paying attention to it. So walk me through the process of how you thought about writing a big piece. Well, it's not done yet. So yeah. <laughs> Got some, yes. So th this one is, uh, yeah. So this is the biggest, this is probably the biggest thing I've written. It's probably the biggest thing I've written. So yeah, I mean, look, a lot of it's the same. It's just the, you know, think, think for a long time, read a lot, um, you know, kind of get my, get my own kind of head organized around it. And then it's basically it, it, for this, it's been kind of working through outlines, um, you know, trying to try and like I said, sort of vomit out all the points, then start to kind of organize them. Um, and, you know, kind of fill in, fill in, fill in the structure, kind of get zeroed in on that and then start drafting, you know, kind of go point by point and draft Google yeah. docs. Uh, yeah, yeah. Right. At this point, at this point, Google docs, um, uh, you know, and I've just like, I, I could go back and forth on like, should I cite? And I, it probably, probably I'm just not going to cite anything. So like for this one, I'm probably not going to cite anything. I'm going to make all kinds of claims. I could cite them all. I'm probably not going to. Why? Um, cause I don't need to. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, who cares? Um, <laughs> does anybody actually care? Um, but I am going to give a reading list at the end. Um, you know, so if you, if you want, yeah, I'm going to give a reading list that if you read all the stuff in the reading list, you would have documentation of everything I, I, I claimed. Um, and then, um. Yeah. And then I'm trying, and then it, it, you know, it's a little, it's a manifesto. So it's a polemic, you know, it's intended to, it's intended to persuade, it's intended to rally true believers. Um, and so it's got to have that kind of spirit and energy to it. Um, I've been reading a lot of older manifestos to try to, you know, just kind of get, get kind of into the right spirit. What have you been learning from that? I mean, it's amazing. Again, yeah, this is one of those things. It's actually kind of amazing. There aren't more manifestos. Like it's such a, you know, there are, there are lots of manifestos that never went, to, went anywhere, but if you look at the impact of like, you know, the communist manifesto or like I, I read, reread the, um, the fascist manifesto, fascist manifesto or, um, have you ever read the futurist manifesto? That's the one I was thinking of. Yeah. 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 The, uh, Mariotti. Yeah. Um, of course. which was sort of, um, it's an artistic and literary statement that captures the spirit of its time. That also foreshadows the rise of fascism. Yes, Italian fascism. Like it really, Mariotti actually played a role. Like yeah. it, it was one of the inspirations for Italian fascism. And so it was, it was sort of simultaneously artistic and emotional and intellectual and and, and it, it 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 was sort of political. Um, you know, except references like the glory of war in there and things like that. But you know, he of course had no way to predict. You know, again, it's like 1910 or 1912 or something. 
you know, so these guys have, you know, you have no way to predict, you know, Marx couldn't predict what happened later. You know, even the people who are overtly political can't predict what happens after the fact. So he, he was somewhere in the middle on that. When you ask for feedback on your writing, what are you trying to get feedback on? I mean, mostly praise, you know, just like, you know, ego stroking. Yeah. Um, People, Mark, this is amazing. I've never read something exactly. like this. Exactly. People make me feel good about yeah. myself. That's my main, that's my main motivation. Um, you know, mostly it's, um, well, I mean, so several things I'm looking for. So one is just like, is it going to make too many people mad? Um, especially for, in, for unintended, uh, unintended reasons. Uh, like if I'm going to make people mad, I want to know I'm going to make them mad. I don't want to like accidentally make them mad. And I, and I have made people accidentally mad in the past. Um, and then, um, that's part of it. And then, you know, clarity, like, you know, does it make sense? Does it convey the thing? Um, and then also, you know, quite honestly, you know, especially from people I really trust, um, you know, it's like, okay, like, is it, you know, does it move, does it move, you know, is it like, you know, sty- is, you know, is it, sty- is it stylistically good enough? Like, does it, you know, does it bog down? And it, it's, it's, it's like the old, it's like the old, say the old writing advice of like, you know, you write your thing and then you take your last paragraph and you make it the first paragraph. And I'm always kind of thinking like that, like, do I have it ordered right? Is it going to hit hard enough up front? Is it going to keep, have kind of motiv- motivating force all the way through? And it's, it's really, you know, you know, all these things where by the time you've written one of these things, you're too close to it and it's really hard to read it with fresh eyes. And so what do people critique you on the most? Oh, I probably making people mad. <laughs> so, so, uh, yeah, dialing in the aggressiveness and then, um, I don't know, like, you know, like I'm going for, like, is you gonna, like, I'm going for effect a lot of, so, you know, some of the feedback will be like, wow, like, you know, this is awfully polemic or this is awfully, you know, and it's like, yeah, that's the, you know, sometimes the feedback is like, yeah, that's, but that's exactly what I'm going for. Like, I'm, I'm not, tr- I'm not trying to be like an objective observer, you know, I'm not trying to be the, the sort of, you know, 30,000 foot observer of things that are happening. I'm trying to like, you know, it, it's all something that's like happening right now that we're in the middle of. Would you ever write a film? Uh, Short film? Only, if, if, yeah, David Milch weighing heavily on me. Yeah? Yeah, I don't know. I, I, I How about for something I, like this, eight minute manifesto, boom, throw it on YouTube, hits. That is not a bad idea. That is actually quite a good idea. Yeah. Give me the assist. That is a good idea. Exactly. You get the goal, two points, I'll take one yes, point for the that assist. That is a very good idea. Well, this is a great example. So this is a great example of like, and there are examples of this, right? This does happen. Um, but yeah, like that arguably, what was the one I just saw? Somebody just did this. I can't remember what it was. Um, but yeah, like because of what the technology now makes possible, maybe there should be far more literally animated shorts. Uh, right. If you're doing a manifesto and you're trying to do something with energy, yeah. throw it in a film, eight minutes long, throw it on Twitter now, I think you do pretty well. Well, and again, the, 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 the circulation mediums over time, like short films have always been a thing, but they're not. Have you ever been to a film festival where they do short films? No. I went to these a couple times in college. Well, it's just like, it's weird, right? Because it's just, it's a weird genre. It's like short stories. Like it's a weird genre because it's just like, you know, the, what, I, what I never like about like short stories or short films is like the minute you get into it, it's over. Right. And so it's this constant bait pullback, you know, kind of thing. And so it's kind of frustrating as a form of fiction. Uh, but there is, to your point, like there's something magical about that. We talked about this, but I, I really feel like we're on the verge here. Like we're in this weird moment where like the LLMs, like the generative, you know, generative AI, like it just, it just literally started working and it already works incredibly well. So it's like this step function thing from doesn't work at all to works incredibly well. And it works incredibly well for helping on writing and it works incredibly well for generating art. And we're sitting here in this moment where like, in theory, like within a year or two, there is going to be a generative AI tool where you feed it an essay and it will give you the short film, right? But it, it doesn't quite exist yet, but we're almost on the verge of that. And then by the way, if you were going to do that today, you could hand do that. You could use, you know, mid journey or stable diffusion or whatever, and you could do what you're talking about, like very quickly. And I could probably literally do it myself, right? With, by just feeding him the text. And so like, we're at this, but like, you know, as you know, like most professional writers aren't doing this, most professional artists, you know. Like we're all sitting here knowing that this latent ability is there and we're not actually doing it yet. And so, and, and I, it's hard for me to judge this, but like, it, it may be that five years from now, you know, we'll, we'll be sitting here and it'll be like, oh my God, this has all changed because all of a sudden both uh, verbal artists and, you know, uh, uh, visual artists are, are able to express themselves in s- s- so much more rapidly yeah. and so much more vividly. How do you think about curating your information environment on Twitter? Yeah. So <laughs> a constant battle, constant struggle. Yeah. You follow um, a lot of people. I follow a lot of people. So, so my, so you must use lists. So yes, I do. I do use lists. Um, and I, I learned the heart of the, the list. The, 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 the list used to be public. They're not public anymore. So if people were writing hit pieces on my lists. Um, so I, I, I sidestep that, but, um, Elon thinks I'm a wuss by the way, but I'm, I'm still going to keep those private. Um, <laughs> it's like, why do you care? 
Um, I'm like, cause there are people working for me. He's like, I got people working for me. And I'm like, I know but you're Elon. Um, so, um, uh, so it goes back to the barbell idea. So basically my primary intake information is it's books and Twitter basically. Right. And so I'm looking for something very specific from Twitter. I'm looking for like the direct feed of what's happening right now. And I'm looking for that from like basically the smartest and most insightful people I can find. Um, and so, um, and so, so basically the, the way that I do it is for the, for the general follows my, my rule is I follow on the basis of a single tweet. Um, and then I block on the basis of a single tweet. Um, and, and so it basically, and, and it's actually, this actually the power of writing. I actually think you can, there are a fair number of people now who I, you know, have follow on Twitter where I realize that they are geniuses, um, based on a single tweet. It is just like, they made some point and I was just like, wow, like there's something special going on there. Right. And on like, and it looked like within 140, like there, there's, you can convey so much in 140 characters where you're just like, okay, this person is really special. So it is unbelievable. It takes two to three sentences to realize that someone's really switched on in high IQ and has a variant perception on how the world works. Yes. Like three sentences. Yes. And that is, as you know, there's very few characters, you know, that's very few. There, there are only, there are only so many different combinations of words that you can put into three sentences. And yet you can still have people who jump out, right? Who it, it really is. And so, and, and Twitter is very good at surfacing those people. So. I mean, I would say Twitter is the most wonderful and horrible thing in the world, right? Like, and, and, you know, everybody always talks about how horrible it is, but it's equally wonderful it's precisely for this reason. Right. And so I'll unfollow on a tweet, I'll block on a tweet and I block extremely liberally and that, and so the overall follow list is just try to get like a gestalt of just like, mm -hmm. you know, the world kind of coming at me. Um, and then I have, I have a, a, a small set of lists that are more curated. And then by the way, look, I, you know, and the other thing I do is I, you know, they change, I change, I change my mind. You know, there are certain, you know, there are certain people who get me like really agitated, <laughs> you know, it's like, and they're fun to follow for a little while. And then it's like, okay, they're, they're doing something to me. They got to go. Last question. Tell me about P Marka. Why is that your screen name? When I was, when I was in college, um, and I, 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 I at the supercomputing center at Illinois that I worked at, and no, nobody had any idea who I was. Um, you know, I was just like a college kid. Um, and so, but my, my, my the boss, my boss's boss at the time. Uh, was sort of famous uh, in th that he had he had two email addresses. He had his regular one, and then he had one that started with P, which was private, which was the one he actually read. And, and it was just, it was just kind of like okay, he's like it was a little bit of like okay, he's like a big important guy, so he needs like the two email addresses. But it was also a little bit like he wants everybody to know that he's a big important guy <laughs> by having the two email addresses. And so in, the, in context, it was very funny for me to say P Market because it implied that I was a big and important guy, and I needed to have the two email addresses. And now everybody knows what it is. And so that doesn't be completely eliminated the utility of the whole idea of a private email address. Huh. It backfired. Well, in there, that was good fun. Thanks, man. Good. Awesome. Thank you, David.